All right, and we're live. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is um, a panel discussion called How to Make a Living as a Musician featuring uh, two Portland-based artists, Farnell Newton and Kevin Simon. Uh, I'll be the moderator. My name is Jonas Angelette. I'm the Community Programs Manager at Portland Center Stage uh, and an artist myself. Um, but we're all in conversation about the different ways you can make a living as a musician from music licensing to scoring films, to live gigs, uh, and everything in between. So um, yeah, we'll just kind of go through intros, uh, go left to right, I guess. So Kevin, if you want to jump in. All right. Uh, my name is Kevin J. Simon. I am a multi-instrumentalist composer, producer based in Los Angeles. I primarily make a living through music for media. So um, that includes music for commercials, television, and film. Um, I also do quite a bit of music supervision um, with various brands and agencies, just kind of guiding the musical process, giving some ideas, um, and oftentimes doing a little bit of problem solving. Um, and then I would say about 20% of the time I make records for listening's sake. So anything from current pop, rap, to nostalgia based music, you know, like classic R&B, Motown ish, whatever, jazz, Latin jazz. Um, I'm a music school kid, uh, was brought up traditionally, um, you know, started playing piano when I was five, evolved into other instruments. Um, and then now I'm kind of like, you know, playing the computer as the main instrument, but still, you know, touching everything. So the music that I make is, uh, more often than not a hybrid of both like synthesis um found sounds um and then like you know organic instruments organic if you will yeah but that's me cool. definitely well uh i'm farnell newton uh i'm a trumpeter producer composer uh i i mean i've kind of done a little bit of everything former professor at portland state university uh toured the world with a bunch of different artists from jill scott to boosie collins and and worked with network television performing on shows and such um the last i would say five years i've been working at marmoset music in the a and r department and uh in charge of infinite companion record label uh, their streaming and distribution of music on um through dsps through uh you know, Spotify and Tidal and Apple Music and such. Um, a lot of times you can find me performing somewhere with a horn or collaborating with musicians. And I also uh, co-own a company called Formation Sound, which is custom music with soul. And then um, I think my, my, my joy project is just making lo-fi hip hop ambient chill music for people to listen to. I've, I've seen a lot of success from that. And so I kind of, I wear a lot of hats, a father of five and, uh, and I just stay busy. <laughs> Actually, no rest for my boy. Exactly. That's exactly. <laughs> I'll be in LA because my daughter is going to school at Cal State Northridge for um, art design and, and track and field. And, and, you know, I stay busy. I'm one of the most busiest people. And I also started this social media group back in the day called Jam of the Week that has over 70,000 musicians uh, around the world and musicians from every band from uh, Snarky Puppy, Beyonce, uh, uh, Prince, Bruno Mars, and everyone. So yeah, I wear all the hats. <laughs> yeah, it's got quite the uh, range of, of options for the both of you. So that's pretty amazing. Um, I think one thing, I mean, we can just kind of run the gamut of, of things that you all touched on, but I know, Kevin, something I've been interested in, and I hear a lot about because I, you know, watching movies and TV, you see the music supervision credits, but I've, I've never been 100% clear on how that role plays out. Um, like, can you talk a little bit about, like, how you got into that and what that entails? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say that music uh, supervision 
has been one of uh, the most recent hats I've started to wear as of, I guess, three years ago or so. Um, and yeah, music supervision is quite elusive because it can mean so many different things. Like the role is forever changing and evolving. Um, my first like real experience as a music supervisor was on a film um, that oddly enough, I was also promoting, so it actually ended up being like quite the workload. But as the music supervisor for the film that or the films that I have worked on, I'm currently working on a horror film as well, is like I'm working as like almost like the um, like the top liaison of everything that's music related for the film. So, you know, I'm sourcing the um, licenses that we pick, right? So, um, you know, um, you get the film, it's a blank canvas. The director has some idea of what they want things to sound like, but I'm actually sourcing the music, you know, finding the artist, dropping it in, making sure it works, going back and forth with the director, seeing that we have the right vibe. And then from there, once it's the right vibe, the other step is like going through and making sure it's easily cleared, making sure it's cleared properly. Everybody's getting their, you know, their back end royalties and their credits and whatnot. So on the film side, is kind of a lot like how it is on the TV side. For the ad side, my music supervision roles are sort of in like that, um, the initial music talks, right? So we'll be with Google or Lumify or Apple or whoever, you know, and then we're in like a Zoom call sort of like this, except there's like way more people, right? It's like 10 people, please mute your mic when you're not talking type thing. Um, and then the client's like, hey, you know, here's our spot. Here's who we want to appeal to. How do we do that musically? So then, you know, you're taking into account like, all right, um, all right, so we're talking about people from this age to this age. You know, you think about what was the most memorable music, like what were the big hit records at the times that you would remember the most, right? You know, for a lot of us, I feel like that sweet spot is like from like, I don't know, maybe 14 to like 25, like you, you, you're really coming into your own as a person and your personality, going through all the emotions. Um, and so some of those records just really stick out more so than they would anything before you were a preteen or teenager or after once you have tons of bills and kids to run after and businesses to run, right? So we hone in on like, what is the most effective piece of music for this audience? Then we go through like, hey, can we afford to license something? Is it worth licensing something? Will this license serve the picture? Like, because that's the other thing, too, is like um, the, the biggest conversation and, you know, you only kind of get to know this once you're working with film. And I'm sure Farnell will agree because he's doing everything. But it's like you got to serve the picture right you know it's one thing to make a record for listening sake a lot of us know how to do that like yo just make a good sounding record right or even how to play in a section like tune it up you know watch your volume make sure you're sliding in to where you're supposed to slide in so it's kind of almost that same sort of idea but then locking it to more of a problem solving mechanism right like the the blank canvas of a picture is like a problem to be solved so you know how do we serve this picture like is this too fast and frenetic for the way the cuts are working is it too sleepy is it too like many notes is it like so like musical that it's crowding the v uh, voiceover you know so those are the considerations that i would make in the music supervision role for advertising because it's a little bit more nuanced than like you know a movie to where it's like hey you can let it play no one's going to be talking like the music's going to carry this spot a lot of times the music doesn't get to carry the spot in advertising because there's a lot of talking a lot a lot a lot a lot of talking yeah no thank you that's that's more insight than I've uh, <laughs> than I've heard in a while. It's uh, it's always <laughs> curious, uh, you know, how it works for film and commercials. Yeah, um, man. I used to, uh, like, I used to know I had some folks on a marketing team um, in a tech company that had like a budget for how to. What was it? It was like they had a monthly budget to license songs and they just would like gather spotify playlists and then check in with the artists and uh you know they would talk about like how they would offer three month contracts to somebody to kind of run as many streams of this uh song as possible so i mean there was like 
not necessarily a music supervision role, but it was like someone who was per always kind of scanning for music yeah, that would work still, in the podcast. Yeah, still a music supervisor, though, in a sense, right? Like, it, mm -hmm. it goes to show, yeah. like, it can literally mean anything depending on what medium, you know, you're supervising, so. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and then, Farnell, do you have any, um, I mean, sounds like you, I mean, you, you have, know, like, many times like that. I mean, as Kevin was saying, you know, like, you know, the music help tells the story. You know, if I've, <laughs> there's been some examples where, you know, you could go online or YouTube and, and they play examples of like uh, a sad section and they have replaced the music with happy music. And it totally changes the whole film and what you're trying to convey in the story. But so it's very important to have the right music uh, that has the right, the post, right beat, right? Is it major? Is it minor? Is it is it too dark? Is it is it a sad part in the in, in the story that needs to be uh, really emphasized? So it, the the music helps tells the story, even though a lot of times it's one of the last thing that's, that gets chosen when you're dealing with ad world uh, and commercials and such. But it's it's very important, you know. It, it helps tells that story from from start to to end you know and that's the great thing about music is you're always telling a story um no matter what that's that and all of my music it, it has a story to go with every song i've created no matter if i was in a happy mood joyous mood or i, I was in a dark place or i was uh you know um i was traveling traveling a lot and looking forward to life and and gigs and such i might make a a, a be funky song or such it all just depends on the music yeah, no, that's, uh, I can, I'm curious too, um, when did you all make the leap to like an interest in licensing or kind of scoring, not third party necessarily, but like other people's work versus um, your own? Not that you stopped doing your own, but like when yeah. you started to decide to, to work with clients, I guess. Well, well, for me, for the most part, it was, uh, you know, I was I was gone on tour from like, I mean, I was home, but I was on the road, probably a seventy percent to eighty percent of the time Ooh. between Jill Scott and um, and Boosie Collins from like two thousand thirteen to like the end of two thousand fifteen, and uh, and my father in law got sick, and and my wife was like, hey, I need you. Um, to be more home and I, 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 me being a family man, I'm like, of course. So I was looking back and I was like, okay, if I'm gonna stay in Portland, I need to find um, what am I gonna do to keep me here? I don't. I did not wanna go back to a public state funded university where students struggle just to get a couple dollars to stay in school and you have to fight for everything. And I didn't want to uh, work in, I was doing music engraving for, uh, one of the world's biggest Catholic companies before um, I was uh, on tour. So I was looking at the various different options and I was already an artist on Marmoset back in 2013. And actually one of my former students um, has been working at Marmoset almost since the very beginning, Eric Norby. And I called them up and I was like, Eric, I said, what's happening over at Marmoset? And he was, he was like, yo, we got a couple positions. So I applied and, uh, and I've been working at Marmoset since 2017. And at the time I was just making music just to make music. I didn't, I didn't really understand like, you know, writing music for commercial and TV or for business branding and such. Uh, and just over the years, I've learned so much about that from working with Marmoset and other uh, various different organizations and, and agencies and such. And uh, yeah, and I'm still learning, but that's, that's, my bread and butter right now, you know, um, creating music for Marmoset and with my business, creating music with other agencies around the country. And, and they're all different. Like Marmoset is more, most of my placements are from, you know, commercials and uh, ads with businesses. And then a lot of my other stuff with other uh, agencies is for TV and film or for, um, and I also, I'll do some music supervision for once in a while, or I'll help um, some, um, independent filmmakers put together music and such and um which is kind of like my my little hobby to be a music supervisor but i i usually like making the music more than anything 
I feel yeah. you on that, man. I, I'd rather make the noise than sort it out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have kind of a similar um, situation. Like, um, it really all started um, uh, for me, like, in college. I was studying jazz, University of North Texas, and then was just like, man, like, I was already gigging, right? Like, I had, like, you know, my little whatever, you know, here and there, like, you know, um, and I was just concerned, like, hey, like, how am I going to, like, really get to the top level? And I sort of felt like, you know, with playing, you can only be in one place at one time, right? You pack it up, you go on the road. The beautiful thing about music, uh, especially, like, when it gets licensed, um, is it's, like, it grows its own legs and can just, like, run all around the globe for you while you sleep. So uh, I read this book written by um, an ad legend, Wendell Haynes. Have you ever heard of him, Farnell? Wendell Haynes? Uh -uh. So he's a big New York cat. Um, he owns a company called Volition, but Volition Sound. But he wrote this book. It was called 30 for 30. I read that when I was like 22. Um, and then I just like jotted down some of the names in the book. And then when I moved from Denton to Dallas, which is like just 45 minutes down the street, uh, I just started hitting up all the ad agencies. Like I, you know, I would rip YouTube commercials and then just recompose them in my spare time. And then like, I was just hitting up these uh, ad agencies just being like, yo, give me a chance, give me a chance, give me a chance. And everybody was like, no, 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 no. Cause like whenever they had the big budget for anything for a broadcast, they were calling people in New York um, and in LA and sometimes Chicago. Finally, I hit up this company called Publicis in Dallas um, I mean, I had friends that worked there too, but they had a situation where they ran out of money and couldn't afford to get like the proper music for uh, this power bar spot. So I ended up getting that and it was so good that they gave me another. Then, you know, things kind of cooled down. I went on the European tour and then my dog died. I mean, you know, not as impactful as Farnell's, you know, loss when he was on tour but you know my dog died and I was like oh, all right let's pack it all up and move to New York and really take the gamble moved up there with like you know just a little bit of change in the boy's pocket you know what I mean um and then just like hit the pavement that summer and then I finally finally found some people after a couple of months of being there who were willing to like you know take risk on me like composing and then from there you know one spot leads to the other keeps going keeps going and now it's like 16 years in the game feeling almost like a spot veteran you know i'm running my own little company working directly with brands and agencies i'm a frequent uh composer for netflix like doing a bunch of um uh theme songs and replacement tracks and even trailers and whatnot um so you know it's uh it was a gradual long slow slink of a process but you know perseverance will get you anywhere yeah no i love the hustle of both your stories like uh <laughs> the uh which is something like i uh i work with a bunch of music producers here in town i run a um a producer showcase called the beat happening where it's just kind of like focused on producers of all ages beat makers musicians stuff like that but a lot of them are like everything is a mystery to them in terms of like how to make money at it they'll just uh you know they'll make a beat and put it on Bandcamp, and then that's it <laughs> that's the end of the promotional run for it and uh like teaching them and talking to them about ways to like make a living and like sometimes you accidentally are a music supervisor and you don't even know that's the title for it like um you know your friend needs a beat for a podcast intro or something and he doesn't work for a company but you're doing that and you're kind of scoring these independent projects but it like it all counts as a resume um and it's something i'm always trying to encourage people to be like yeah you you can you don't always need rappers or vocalists on your stuff like you can you can find homes for a lot of your work. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I, so true. I, I'm constantly telling, you know, when I when I when I really dive was like at Marmoset for a while, and I was like, I was like, wait, I started hitting up all the the homies and everything, and I'm like, dude, I know you got hundreds of beats sitting around on a hard drive, you know, like like 
don't let the music just, you know, you know, I say like no tracks uh, gets left behind, you know, like, you know, I'm always creating and I'm always putting music in the system because you never know. It's usually those songs that you didn't really think much about that can earn you some great money throughout That's the year. That's true too. So, it's always the sleepers. You're like, what? Okay. Always, right. always. And then that song you don't put in, you know, like <laughs> yeah. like 40 to 80 hours, you're like, you, you didn't <laughs> see anything. So, and, but it just t lets people know. I'm, and that's, I'm constantly telling, you know, you know this, Joan, it's just constantly telling musicians and producers and stuff. And I'm like, hey, there is, uh, a ton of content these days. If you think about it, every business has to clear music for their social media, no matter if it's Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, they have to clear the music. And now with TV shows and film, on a TV show, there's probably over 30 minute, uh, 30 different song placements in an episode. And mind you, if that's like a syndicated show, you know, they're probably doing 24 episodes and that's that's hundreds and hundreds of songs needed a season. So there's so many ways that you can succeed without having to be like hitting the payments to do gigs or travel or 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 other things. You know, you could have success from the comfort of your home. Um, yeah. And then just to echo what Farnell said is like, yeah, there's never been as much new media ever in existence as there is now right remember like it used to be like all right you either get some radio play you either get a movie or you get a tv show or commercials now you got like podcasts you got the whole youtuber generation who's like just doing daily vlogs and blogs like that stuff has to get cleared right then you have um TikTok, you got instagram like all the social media shorts and stuff and like that's the thing is like you know Nike and Adidas and Facebook, like they're seriously grabbing up a ton of license for like little six second joints, you know? And this used to never be a thing. Like, so new m media has, I don't know, like probably quadrupled at least, you know, cause there's so much need for music. And like Farnell said too, is like, yo, these instrumentals, they go more than the stuff with the vocals. Like if you have something with the vocals on it, like typically it lures the the licensor in and they're like yes this is great now mute the whole verse you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's like okay great <laughs> so true <laughs> definitely yeah it's it's pretty crazy and amazing you know to be able for me it's always about you know trying to give people the tools and the the, the resources so then you know they don't have to stress out about like you know, they, they're trying to go on tour or they're trying to do a record. I mean, nowadays it's almost crazy to do a record before, you know, 10, 15, 20 studio and a project, you know, musicians, mixing, mastering, um, PR, the whole night. And now it's like, you can literally, you know, spend less time, less effort, to put music together with collaborating with key people and being able to win um, compared to before, because it's hard to, the, you know, with streaming the way it is and such, it's hard to justify spending that type of money in, in certain, uh, in a certain way. So like for me, I'll make a lo-fi, some lo-fi music. That's great because during a pandemic, uh, you know, background music and also ambient music was very therapeutic for people from piano music and, and chill hop and chill beats and such to the point where it's like, we've seen the, the market of that go crazy as well with streaming or finding that niche in your streaming and, and putting out those songs and finding success in streaming where a lot of people are having hard times to do so. So it's like, you gotta wear all the hats, you know, composing. I mean, one time I remember at Marmoset, uh, we had, um, I think it might have been like Chiquita Banana was like, Cause so we need someone to write out some music for us of our theme songs, our old and our new theme songs. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, let me go and write that out real quick. That's that's a job of being able to, to compose yeah, music, write music. Yeah, right. yeah, and then it's like, you know, you I might need to help uh, a creative put music to a film. Or I might, you know, I mean, it's so many different hats to gigging. I was just at a gig last night 
but then I'm here working my day job with Marmoset, but I'm also creating music and projects and such. And then it's like, you know, Kevin might be like, yo, I got a song, man. Um, my, my regular cat, you know, Jay Jennings is not available. Can you that record, yeah. you know, shout out to Jay Jennings. Now yeah. I see where the connection with University of North Texas with Mike Moz and all of those cats yeah, yeah. and such. But it's just like you, the collaboration. Me and you, Jonas, have even collaborated and released songs together and projects. And it's just like the constant collaboration, constant being adaptable and versatile to to take on different projects. It's, it's like the way to survive as a musician these days. Yeah, and then just to chime in, I mean, Farnell's dropping all these gems, but like the adaptability thing, oh man, like like let this pandemic situation be a lesson to all of us. Like, cause you know, back in like maybe 2018, I was kind of preaching that to some of my friends. Like, you know, I'm just like, hey man, like you're a great horn player, you're a great strings player, you're blah, blah, blah. Like I could use you, like, could you just go and get like a setup? It doesn't have to be that crazy. I'll walk you through it. Like all you gotta do is just be able to give me dry stems and we can make magic together. And then like the pandemic hit and you know, for those people who were already set up like that, it was a little bit of a smoother transition because you know, that's how, you know, me and Jay, like we used to work all the time. Like he would have to come over here. You know, we'd take a couple hours out of the day, track these horns and then like, you know, blah, blah, blah. But now it's like, hey, I can send him the idea or sing something over the phone or whatever. And he can record it at his house and then send it to me. So while he's doing that, I could be moving on to something else. You know, he doesn't have to be getting in the whip, you know, showing up physically, you know, he doesn't even have to get dressed, right? You know what I mean? You could just sit there, knock it out, and then that's a gig right there, a gig at home, a solid yeah. gig. Yeah, that's me in my pajamas. <laughs> Yo, but you're still, you're you're a warrior for now, because, like, look, dude, I, like, I've let some of my chops deteriorate. You know, there's nothing like being on the bandstand and, like, really getting it in. So I just admire cats like you who are just like, yo, I'm just going to keep running. Like, you know, yeah. just the energizer bunny over there, man. Like, that's wild. Man. It's, hey, that's the thing. Wearing those hats, man, and providing, you know. I'm yeah. like, yo, I'm like, you know, I got two kids at college. I'm like, Woo! you know, Woo! it's like I stay busy. <laughs> yeah. I only got one kid and one on the way. He just started kindergarten, so I don't even know about that college level hustle. Yeah. Some serious bills right there. That's <laughs> like, look, we got to let's go ahead and power up the computer and get this money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Sending emails on the gig. Yeah, you know I mean, yeah. supervising in between solos. Hey, that's how it is. <laughs> Yeah, and something that you mentioned, Farnell, too, like during the pandemic, like I had friends who uh, who would tell me that they started listening to music to like do yoga too, or to like just to calm down too, you know, like in the midst of all the protests in Portland. And, and I was just like, I mean, it was funny because I was like, I'm not thankful for the pandemic, but to be told that I'm just stuck at home in my studio for months at a time, I was like, I could make a million songs. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. But it, and it led to a lot of collaborations. Like, I know not everybody, you know, some people kind of burnt out from the from the pandemic, but, like, some people saw it as an opportunity to kind of, like, build their catalog and kind of explore things, you know, teach themselves something about it. So it, yeah. it, it's been interesting to see how people adapted. Um, yeah, I did, this, that emerged. I did the same thing that Kevin was talking about, like, I tapped all the homies up and, and my, my trombone player and, and everybody. And I was like, yo, get you a focus, right? Scarlet, whatever, mm -hmm. get you a microphone. Like we got to stay busy because in the beginning of the pandemic, cause I kind of locked down the, the week before officially everyone would stay at home. And I was twiddling my thumbs and I was like, cause I was supposed to be like on tour. I was supposed to be like, like, just gone like the whole that summer i was looking forward to i was like yo this is gonna be a nice summer i'm gonna be on the road and march i was at home like literally like twiddling my thumbs like i can't go nowhere like my anxiety was like you know depression was about to start kicking and i said what can i do so i don't fall into that dark place and i said well 
I've been wanting to make sample packs for a while. Let me uh -huh. just start. And I just I just started to record and record building stacks and stuff. And I hit up, um, I hit, I, I think I reached out to Lander. And Lander was like, yo, we love you. you. We already know who you are and everything. Like, let's do it. And I put out multiple packs with them for horns, for lo-fi, for beats and everything. And it really not just helped me stay creative and busy at a time where I couldn't do anything it also helped you know like my team members and such you know i'll, I'll hit my trombone player yo i need 25 loops uh, or i hit a keyboard player i need 100 loops or i hit um like my man jamal nichols from uh, gregory porter in st louis and i was like yo what are you up to i know you're not gigging so <laughs> <laughs> let me send me 25 loops of you playing bass who's an amazing uh, electric and upright bass player and was like send them over and then we're like cool like i just got everybody broke off with some money and then it's like what's the next pack what's the next project until you know i can start gigging and thinking about those things again and it, and it helped me also double down in my music licensing and really formulate the industry and the structures and songs and and the know-how and to to elevate myself you know and my my production level so it, now I'm more of an introvert. I'm I'm usually like the person that's out kicking it, hanging out, schmoozing and stuff. Now I'm like, man, I want to go back to the house, watch a show with the kids, and uh, and then get back on the the computer, you know. Yeah, um, but yo, like the sample pack hustle, yeah, like it's so it's so geared to anybody who's a master of their instrument you know so many guys in my you know i guess musical ecosystem especially coming up you know from where i'm from are absolute masters of their one instrument and also like great at others but you know like if you've put in like all those hours to become a top tier player like you could benefit so greatly from just lending your sound and your ideas to you know other producers who are looking for found sounds right you know yeah so that's a hustle that you know i guess it, it's still a little untapped right for like all these like you know virtuosic musicians it's like man like yeah, you know, that's a that's a cool hustle. Yeah, there's a not too much of a departure from that, but that's something that you touched on, Kevin, about like um, all the different types of media that are out there to kind of for those things to reach. Um, mm -hmm. Like part of some of, I mean, it's I'm not an educator, but like a lot of the people that I work with are like, you know, they'll post something on Instagram or something, and then it'll get a copyright strike against it because they did it in the video and not not understanding the process of like submitting music to an aggregator that will then have that music available so you can tag it properly and you know, like even walking through people walk teaching people about that process like getting your music out there to the point that people can choose it if they're trying to source something for a video even if they don't know who you are but like you know they'll listen through the little samples and and tag you in a video and you have like zero connection to somebody in china playing your music but yeah um it's really interesting that like the breadth of all these different ways you can get your sound to people whether it's through stems or or songs yeah i mean that was the important thing about the the pandemic for me also was that I was able to collaborate with more artists, you know, working with lo-fi hip hop artists. I was working with kids who literally just <laughs> graduated high school and was at Berkeley School of Music or some small school who might be from India or Italy or, or from Boston uh, or Baltimore, Maryland. And we're out here collaborating, making music together and doing pretty well on streaming and and because of that, I've had a ton of people reach out to me. Hey, I love your song. This song really helped me through um, some tough times and such. Because it was meant, it's meant to just be relaxed, listen to. I put it on with the kids when they're just hanging out and playing. You know, just kind of to chill and and to relax. And and I feel like music really helped people during the pandemic find peace. And I mean, you could look at all of the stats and data, like how much. People was listening to music, listening to podcasts. I mean, all. I mean, what we would we have done without music during that time? It was, 
there was some rough stuff, man, happening during the pandemic. And I'm just happy, you know, music was there to to, to kind of save a lot of us, you know. Yeah, and what, what is it that they said, too? Um, was that, like, that was the one thing that, um, I guess, primarily Americans refused to give up was entertainment, you know? I mean, I guess that's obvious, like, since you're stuck at home. But still, it's like, as people, you know, were getting laid off from their jobs, wondering where their next, like, you know, few dollars were coming from, they were still very willing to spend it on the things that brought them joy, like music oh, yeah. and movies. I mean yeah, and that and you know, and these TV companies, man, they figured it out real quick. Cause I remember uh, when Tiger <laughs> Tiger King and these key shows was coming out, that literally like the streaming went through the roofs because guess what? We were all home, at and that's the same all we were time. talking about, right? Yeah, that was, was, we were watching. Yeah. I even remember <laughs> we some traveling. Some there was some rappers that made a whole Tiger King EP, and I was like, this we yeah. need something else to do. TV yeah. shows, uh, social media challenges, sourdough bread making, like all of that stuff literally kept a lot of people from like falling into those hard places. And, but, you know, that entertainment and, and that, 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 all of that content out there helped a lot of us get through this. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I was worried in the beginning of the pandemic. I was like, man, how is this going to affect the licensing industry? This is going to be crazy. Like, you can't be on there putting out uh, Toyota ads during a pandemic. Like, who who's buying cars right now? We're struggling. Yeah. Like, but I mean, but now it seems like it's it's, it's like doubled down and and it's it's go, it's taking off. Yeah, everyone's get back outside, back outside. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, that's uh, like in terms of uh, the youth, though, I know, I mean, not necessarily your kids, but like, is there stuff that you've had to tell younger folks, younger musicians um, about like how to make a living post pandemic with their music? Or I mean, I guess during the pandemic, too, but um, just the kind of lessons that you would tell an up and coming musician now who had to like. Like I met somebody who spent who like started and finished college online because of the pandemic, which was oh, wild wow. to me. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So it like, was I, I would say, you know, it was it was a time like pandemic was a couple of things was happening. There were people who took that time to really double down and learn new things, languages, go to school, go to college, learn how to mix and master, learn how to do various different online schooling, coding. Coding, free yeah, code coding. camp, like free code camp was like blowing up and such. But at the same time, as a lot of people was like, they were like, you know, let's you take your twelve hundred dollars from the government and put it in and invest it. But at the same time, you had people, and it was okay for them to just like make it by. It was just like like taking that time, taking the space to be like, hey, I'm not going to do anything right now. I'm just going to make it through this pandemic and, and and try to make it a sane person and such. So it was like a couple of different things happening, but I'm, I'm, you know, I work with young, I've been working with young people forever since I was in, in college. And I'm just always trying to really just tell them like, don't be afraid to put in a work that you literally could be successful in anything and and everything you do. I'm like Mr. Side Hustle King. Like this is the first time I think my side hustle has been music and my job has been music. I, I'm not making bracelets. I'm not doing anything web design. I'm not, I'm just doing that. But I tell people like, if you put in that time, put in all those hours, you're going to be successful and no matter what you do, but you can't be afraid to do the hard work. I mean, especially in licensing, there is, I I just came up, well, I didn't come up, but I, I just thought about it, talking to my wife and my business partner, Hunter Love, and I was saying that there is no instant gratification in music only from the consumer who's listening. Every other part of the music industry, it takes time, it takes hard work, it takes learning, figuring it out collaboration and such there is no instant gratification so you could figure it out and be successful but you gotta want to put in the time and effort hit up the kevin j simons and be like yo what are you doing hit up 
the the Jonas, the Farnells, the whoever, and and pick their brain. That's what I did as a young jazz musician growing up in Philly and 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 uh, as an undergrad in Ohio and living all over the country. I, I went to the old heads and was like, hey, how can I get great? You know, show up, practice, learn from them, talk to them, and and put in the work. And I feel like. I'm still putting in the work and feel like I'm just getting started still, even though I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a long forever uh, chase, you know, because it's yeah. still trying to run away from you. Because like with other new ways to do things, new ideas, new workarounds, it's like you're forever learning. But yeah, like Farnell said, it's like, you know, there's almost no shortcut other than like finding mentorship. That's the closest thing you'll get to a shortcut because you're able to, you know, cipher all those years of knowledge from somebody like, you know, my career would not have been possible if it wasn't for my mentors. I should name him Jeff Rosner, who's like, like that dude took me under his wing and showed me like, you know, the business aspects and pointing me in the right directions and even just made the connections. Then a guy named Josh Brockhausen, who basically was like, hey, you make good music, but it's not that good. Like, here's how we get it better. You know what I mean? You know, so it's like getting, you know, that sort of attention and care is like a huge, huge stepping stone too. So, you know, kudos to you guys, you know, who, you know, you're obviously both mentors. Um, you know, I pride myself in being a mentor, but, you know, for anybody who may see this and who is trying to figure out how do I get to the next level, you got to find somebody, man. Like, I don't know if you've ever, like, you know, searched for anything or hunted anything down, but these people, they're all walking around with the knowledge and the connections, um, you know, that you need. And, um, you know, there's a big chance that they'll see a part of themselves in you and will reach out, you know, to uh, help you. Because, like, the funny thing about having a mentor, and I, I wonder if you guys feel like this, is like, you know, your mentors who give you all this knowledge, you can't really pay it back. It's like, what am I going to do for you other than do well myself and then just pass it on? Like, that's what I love about the whole, like, position of mentorship and that idea. It's like, it's not an exchange. Basically, it's just pouring into this cup with the hopes that that cup will pour into another cup. You know what I mean? So it's like for everybody who makes it what to the top of the ladder or whatever, it's your job to reset hand back down and pull it up. Um, so for anybody who's trying to find a way, you know, come find me. I'm not easy to find, but if you find me, I'll give you some time. Yeah, no, that's that's, <laughs> that's great. I, I, you guys both made me think. Um, I remember the day that I realized, like, you know, you, you hear about ASCAP and BMI and the music <laughs> rappers always drop that in there. But I was just like, I never knew what that was. And the day that somebody sat with me and we talked over PROs and like how to register and get your publishing and how to register as a writer and all those things. I was like, wow, this is, I know, I know so many musicians who just have zero idea what that is. So means. many high zero. level musicians. Zero. Zero. High level zero. Like people yeah. who are playing on important yeah. records. I'm like, oh, what's your PRO information? And they're like, wait, what? And yeah. it's like, no, dude, like, like that's because here's the thing too is like, you know, I didn't go to the most contemporary music school, but my school was just like, hey, here's how you play. This is how you analyze this. This is how you play that. This is how you read this. This is how you hear that. Like they show you everything except for like some of the stuff that's really gonna like affect your pockets and your earnings. You know what I mean? Like had someone told me like initially like, hey, get your PRO sorted ASAP. Like, you know, that was just something I like kind of came across myself as I was like coming into my first license. And then I was just like, oh, wow, like I've had music on the radio and stuff like this. And I hadn't had this stuff hemmed up. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's, it's like, you know, you know, you, you going to University of North Texas. I went to Oberlin Conservatory of Music. These are like, you know, some of the, the best schools in the country and such. And even though, like I said, I learned how to play and do all of these things, but, you know, that business aspect of it was not there. And I didn't learn that till later. You know, I didn't know these things. And then when I was learning about it and starting to move on that knowledge, a lot of musicians around me was like, what is this? What are you talking about? What is that? And then it's, it's, I'm constantly having this, this discussion. I had a discussion with a, a drummer 
And I was like, dude, I need your PRO information. I can't find it anywhere. And because that's part of one of my jobs too, a marmer said, I'm usually finding people's PRO. And he's like, oh, I don't have one right now. And I was like, wait, but you, you just recorded and collaborated with one of the biggest artists in the country, in the world. And where's your PRO at? I was, he's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm about to get it back before the album comes out. And I'm like, you're constantly creating, like cover your music. And, and even when you know this PRO stuff, it's still like stuff within that you don't know. You know, you're like, okay, cool. I understand this, but how do I get my broadcast royalties? Or how do I get my performance royalties? If you're playing with this big artist and all of these world venues and tours, and they're playing one of your songs, you could collect money off of that every time you perform it in the stadium. Every time it's on the TV, you should be able to collect money. So, but these are things that's not taught, but, and that's why you got to find the, the people in the industry and the business. You know, I've been very fortunate. I've always been that person. Of, if I didn't know something, I went and tapped on doors. I'm like, hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? You know, how do I get my horns to sound as crisp? You know, I I remember t hitting up Kevin and was being like, yo. Who's that on trumpet on your song? Man, this joint sounds dope. It's fat. It's like clean. And he's like, oh, it's Jay Jennings. And I'm like, oh, that's my homie. Yeah. But but at the oh, same yeah. time, it's like, it's like, that's great and, and wonderful. But what did you do to put on the plugins? Like, what did you do? What let, let me find out. You know, that's you gotta be able to to be a go-getter as a musician and not let your, you know, uh not you know, don't be prideful, like figure yeah. it out, talk to them, treat them out to coffee. I'm about building genuine relationships. I'm like, yo, if I'm in your city, I'm taking you out to dinner, lunch, and we just kicking it first. And then later I might be like, hey, I want to figure out what you're doing, but we've already established a friendship and a connection. And then, you know, like, let's start talking about ways of I could elevate my stuff to get to that level that this person is at. Yeah, and like Farnell said, it's like everybody has like something that they're doing uh, that, you know, the other person isn't. So it's like even if it's someone who you think is like, you know, still kind of finding their way in their sound, like you could literally watch them do stuff. You'd be like, wait, what is that? How did you do that? What was this? I mean, even someone who's just been working um, in a DAW for a year, like that's my favorite thing about collaboration is like, you know, just seeing like the different ways to do stuff and then the, you know, the, the results that they create, because I don't know, man, like there's just so much knowledge, right? It's like as much as we like try to strive to know everything about music and production and all this stuff, there's no way, right? We're always going to be like this coin size, like, you know, drop in a bucket. So yeah, like not having that fear, right? Because you know everybody knows we don't know everything. So it's like, why, why you gotta pretend like that? Just go out. And yeah. just, you know what I mean? Like exactly. You know, right? Like it's just like <laughs> man, just go and get the knowledge, man. Yeah, like I, that's a beautiful thing. And and then the wonderful thing about that too, I'm sure Farnell will agree too. Is it like it's inspiring too? Like just to get that new information and new ideas it's going to keep your workflow you know evolving too and that's the biggest thing that we all face too right it's like how are we going to keep making new stuff if we're making stuff all the time it's like you got to get you got to input you got to input maybe even more than you output uh -huh. yeah, yeah it's wild right. too because some of those things are like 50 dollars for a lifetime subscription and people act like Oh, I need to be signed to a label before I do this. And you're like, no, you don't. So no, you don't. Like, it's like, <laughs> yeah, things you got to learn, but it's like some people, it's just, you know, it's like an eternal quest to find. It is. It's, it's a marathon, man. It's, it's, that's a, it, do, doing, doing anything in the music, music industry is a marathon and there's Ooh. no like instant wins and you might get some, some, easy gratification once in a while but it's then next thing you know you feel like you've taken four steps back before you even grow more and we're just constantly out here that's the great thing about you know finding like-minded artists who are willing and down and want to collab and do things and it's like and if i don't know something i can't know everything so let me hit up somebody and try to collaborate with them that might have more understanding in that and something i could learn and, and brush off off one. I just finished doing uh, a 
uh, some some Latin trap and, and salsa stuff. But then when you, you know, I can't speak Spanish, you know, my wife's fluent, but like, but I could find an artist that that's fluent and, and speaks both English and Spanish who could collaborate and take my song to a bigger height and such. And then you're just like, okay, cool. Well, let's work out these splits. Let's put this out and let's see what we could do with it. And and it's like you got you can't be afraid to also put out the music because people are like, I don't know if people will like my music. Like there's people out there in every stages of life, and they're just looking for good music and finding songs to connect with. And, and I'm like, once you release that and just start putting out music, you just, you're going to find more fans and more listeners and more streams and more, more love from, of your music. You know, I mean, that's probably when I let go that, that mindset of everything being perfect. I felt like that's when I really was creating and letting music, music go, you know, I mean, I'm just a jazz guy and I'm like, I, I do well in streams. So <laughs> I love it. No one's just a jazz guy anymore. Yeah. Oh, that's that's true too. I mean, <laughs> and, 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 and all that, that's the great thing about you know, like so-called jazz musicians. Like we're we're everywhere. We're in all the bands. <laughs> we're just in all the, in the dark, you know, country, just, folk, soul, yeah. everything, pop. We're we're everywhere. <laughs> that is so true, man. Yeah, you're right. You look at any like touring band, like half of those dudes are jazz guys. Yeah. Adaptability, being versatile and being adaptable uh, in the styles of music and, and their main instruments. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so man. I'll, uh, well, as we wind down here, I just wanted to like see, give you guys a chance to kind of talk, shout out uh, any projects you're working on or like where people can find you. Uh, and I'll post it in the video uh, description once we get this up. But um, yeah, just if you guys want to talk about Kevin, you want to start? Yeah, yeah. Um, I got um, quite a few things coming out. Like normally I play like the uh, background, right? Like I'm producing stuff with um, my homeboy, Seth Hirsch. Um, who else do I got coming out? This guy, Nady G. Um, shout out to Madi. Shout out to 7AM. Like a bunch of different cats I'm working with. But I'm actually trying to holler at Farnell about getting a, um, a, a personal record released here soon under the um, Marmoset slash Infinite Companion um, label. So, I mean, hopefully that'll be happening in a few months. I, I got to circle back on that, but I got the yeah, team. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, yeah, like, you know, just keeping it moving, man. Like in here cooking every day, you know, cooking on various things. Definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm always, you know, between, you know, um, between Formation Sound, my, you know, my business doing music with my partner, Hunter Love. I'm also doing the lo-fi hip hop with my label, Lo-Fi Jazz Soul, which also doubles as a radio show on our jazz station here in Portland. Oh, nice. and, uh, and right now, just, you know, just really pushing that because, you know, and helping other musicians find success in streaming and, 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 um, and what else am I working on? I'm, I mean, I'm always working on g some gigs. You go in Portland, you can always find me somewhere gigging, uh, somewhere with with Tyrone Hendrix and my homies. But uh, um, usually, that's about it right now. Between Marmoset, Formation Sounds, and Lo-Fi Jazz, so that's where I'm at. Or I'm hanging out with these kids and and and, and family, you know, at the house. Yeah, and uh, I mean, like I said at the beginning, I'm a musician too. I go by Love Jones, L U V J O N E Z, uh, on all streaming platforms and playing different gigs around the city and hosting a beat happening. So, and a Marmoset artist. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to Marmoset. Yeah, all, all <laughs> three of us. <laughs> yes, shout out, shout out to Marmoset and also to, to the homie Janae for yeah, uh, she's reaching out. Janae, yeah. uh, and Janae reached out to me uh, about doing this. So shout out to, to Love well. Jones and Janae. So. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so we'll uh, wrap it up. And thank you all for joining and sharing your knowledge and, and your histories with us. Yo, it was great chatting with you both, man. You guys are going to keep hearing from me. Appreciate y'all. Talk yeah. to you soon. All right. All take right, care. Man, you guys have a good one. Peace. Peace.